assistant professor in the Department of Oncology at Georgetown University School of Medicine. He focuses his work at the intersection between markets, public policy, and the public health. Lieber received his PhD from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor in 2020 in the Health Services Organizations and Policy Program with focus on political science. Since 2008, Lieber has contributed to the field of tobacco control policy research, first at Ohio State University during his bachelor's degree, then at Emory University during his master's degree, and then at the American Cancer Society as a part of the Economic and Health Research Program. He employs quantitative and qualitative methods to answer pressing questions about the causes and effects of regulation, particularly in the areas of tobacco control and novel tobacco products. Our discussant today is Dr. Catherine McLean. Dr. Lieber will present his research in two segments. We'll have a pause after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. Lieber, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you very much, Justin, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'll get started. So uh, the title of this grand rounds talk is, again, evaluating the impact of regulatory policies using tobacco sales data. Uh, I am a member of the Center for Assessment of Tobacco Regulations, or CASTOR. So it's a Tobacco Center of Regulatory Science at the FDA. Uh, they pay my salary, and they are wonderful colleagues uh, who I'm very uh, 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 privileged to be a part of. Uh, today's work is uh, sponsored with help uh, from the Norwegian Cancer Society in a partnership with the Polish Ministry of Health, as well as the Truth Initiative and uh, their Schroeder Institute. Um, the, I've had really great co-authors and helpful colleagues who made this work possible, uh, uh, namely David Levy, Chris Cadam, uh, Luz Maria Sanchez Romero, uh, Tops his own Mike Pesco, uh, Michal Stoklosa, Zachary Kahn, uh, Megan Diaz, Emily Donovan, Barbara Skillo, Donna Valone, Ken Warner, Jeff Throat, Holly Jarman, and Scott Greer, who made all these papers possible. Uh, and I want to say that this wouldn't have been work, wouldn't have been possible without you folks. Um, so uh, we're going to be in the interest of transparency, very, very transparent uh, about any potential conflicts of interest. So I and my co-authors of these uh, studies have worked for organizations uh, the American Cancer Society, the Truth Initiative, and the World Health Organization that have adopted positions on the public policies being studied. Um, uh, one article today, the one that is in press uh, called Evali and U.S. Tobacco Sales had to clear an internal review process prior to publication at the Truth Initiative. Uh, the subject of that uh, review process was entirely editorial, had nothing to do with the analytics. Uh, and so I, if you're going to look at math, math is math and we'll be able to talk about that. Uh, and we made those decisions independent of uh, any, any internal review process. Um, and the opinions expressed here are my own and do not represent, represent uh, uh, my employers, the co-authors, or anyone else's employers. So uh, going forward today, the plan for the talk is it will be given in two sections. Uh, uh, the first section is going to look at a theoretical paper and an empirical paper. The theoretical paper concerns uh, in a, uh, a framework that I'm advancing to a comparative regulation called the regulatory stances, uh, and then an empirical analysis of uh, the Evali outbreak of 2019 and its effect on U.S. tobacco sales. Uh, and then we will pause and we will have a couple questions, and then we're going to go to Poland's menthol cigarette ban, uh, an analysis of uh, what happened when uh, the European Union's largest consumer of menthol cigarettes was subject to a menthol cigarette sales ban in May of 2020. So uh, we'll go forward from there. Uh, so uh, in this really heavily econ-focused uh, seminar, uh, I'm going to throw some political science in here because that is my background uh, from my doctorate. And I think we all need uh, some good, rigorous ways to talk about regulatory policy in a comparative perspective, because I think that's a great way to learn lessons. We use lots of words to describe regulation, regulatory policy, and policy preferences. Some of these words are imbued with positive emotions and others are decisively more negative. However, a language of comparative regulation has mostly been missing from the collective vocabulary of public policy scholars. Without such a language, our discussions around policy preferences are not precise and are often characterized by opponents on different sides of the regulatory policy issues by not being able to disagree on uh, descriptions for their own positions. Uh, we throw around lots of different kinds of terms that are on the, in this little word cloud and not all of them are super inherently meaningful. And I uh, performed a doctoral dissertation 
which was a qualitative study of the development of e-cigarette regulations in New Zealand, Australia, and Canada. And during this, I needed a good way to like describe how these uh, regulations should be categorized and how they changed over time. And so it lead me, led me to try to come up with a rigorous way to describe regulation. And uh, this work uh, will be eventually featured in an upcoming book uh, that I uh, have under advanced contract at the University of Toronto Press called Vape Filled Rooms, uh, expected 2023. <laughs> uh, so, I, uh, uh, I take economists at their word. I'm not an economist myself. I consider myself to be more of a political scientist who's trained in proximity to health services researchers, epidemiologists, and economists. But I take economists at their word that markets must be regulated to resolve market failures. I argue that any market failure has an implicit remedy by policies that intend to alter the size of a given market. We need language to accurately communicate regulatory policy positions across markets, place, time, and domain. And if all regulations resolve a market failure, all it, therefore all regulations and policy preferences possess an intended effect on market size in the future relative to the present, meaning they want to change market size or not. But the, this intended effect, I argue, is something called a regulatory stance. I use a refinement of the political scientist Robert Parlberg's framework developed to describe diverging regulatory policy towards genetically modified foods that I refer to as the range of regulatory stances. The primary measure used to determine a regulatory stance of a given jurisdiction towards a given market is the intended size of a market as a share of an economy in the future compared to the present. I argue that a regulatory stance can be determined for any market in any jurisdiction at any time. By assessing the competitive advantages and disadvantages provided to each market compared to its close substitute market, and I argue all and always exists, uh, we can get an idea of the intended size of a market in the future compared to the present. The range of regulatory stances extends from prohibitionist stances, which aim to decrease a market size to zero, all the way to universalist, which seeks to expand a market to the largest extent possible. I believe that most markets are typically subject to a regulatory stance somewhere in between these extremes, wherein some markets receive a contractionist stance that seeks to decrease the size of a market, while others are subject to an expansionist stance that seeks to increase the size of a market. Other markets are not subject to a size or preference provided to or provided explicit advantages or disadvantages and are deemed subject to a permissive stance. Now, I will use these particular icons again and again and again throughout this presentation to sort of illustrate the utility of the regulatory stances and to quickly describe what is the intended effect of a policy on market size in the future relative to the present. Uh, so here's an example. I can create a chart uh, uh, dividing markets uh, and policy domains to organize the concept of a regulatory stance. If we look at two close substitute markets, uh, cigarettes and e-cigarettes, I'm taking this as an empirical uh, reality that they are substitutes, uh, just for argument's sake. We can see an example of how a regulatory policy that uh, say limits the sales of non-tobacco pod mod e-cigarettes would create competitive advantages and disadvantages for different market divisions, thereby leading to changes in market size over time. Being that if you can't sell a fruit flavored uh, tobacco pod mod, you'd expect that market to say decline if say a fruit flavored disposable e-cigarette is allowed. Uh, and I envision these policies as arising from actions across different policy domains like public use or pricing. And some policy decisions on certain domains should be more consequential than others. But I believe that when we're looking across a wide enough array of policies, we can glean the regulatory stance for a given market division by assessing which ones are most powerful and least powerful and kind of get the idea of where the market is sort of intended to head. And that is what a regulatory stance is. As regulations are further developed to say ban use of filtered uh, filters in cigarettes, uh, we might see that changing a product standard to prohibit one product would cause another product uh, to grow and place further downward pressure on the market as a whole. The regulatory stances concept is flexible enough to be able to prioritize effects in one domain over others and produce an overall regulatory stance. And I, I should just say that you could uh, argue that the regulatory stance can be applied at any level of a market. In this example, uh, if you were to say ban filters on cigarettes, you would expect the overall cigarette market to say decline and perhaps uh, by 
correcting uh, uh, perceptions about relative harm to grow the e-cigarette market in, in that particular uh, reaction to that particular kind of policy. So why use regulatory stances? In sum, I believe regulatory stances concretely and de uh, define an actuated concept in comparative regulation that can clearly articulate uh, policy preferences, positions, and effects. We can and should use regulatory stances to open discussion of comparative regulation and uh, to a wider range of markets and disciplines. Uh, the top reasons why we should use a regulatory stances are, are, are as follows. A regulatory stance always exists in all places. Lessons can be drawn from anywhere. A regulatory stance for a given market has inherent meaning and is not derogatory, meaning one a policy stakeholder should be able to identify one another's positions without causing un unnecessary hurt or miscommunication. And in doing such policy preference articulation, attention is focused on especially market size, which I believe to be a productive lens for policy innovation. For example, in the realm of e-cigarettes and cigarette regulation, we speak ad nauseum about gateway effects and directionality between e-cigarette and cigarette use. Once we accept that the two products are substitutes, then we might view a gateway effect between them not as an unalterable law of physics, but as a product of regulatory policy choices. If we want there to be no gateway effects from e-cigarettes to cigarettes, then quickly contracting the markets for cigarettes seems like a good way to get around worrisome gateway effects. At least that's my argument. So let's go for an application of regulatory stances and uh, look at our first uh, empirical piece. So this was published in Tobacco Control uh, last month. Uh, its title is Evali and U.S. Tobacco Sales. I worked in the piece with Zach Kahn, Megan Diaz, Barbara Skillo, Emily Donovan, and Donna Valone. Uh, the last four authors work at the Truth Initiative Schroeder Institute. And Zach and I uh, started work on this paper while we were employees of American Cancer Society, Inc., although it was just published uh, in these last few months while uh, Zach and I moved on to different employment. Uh, so what was Evali? Uh, well, it was, uh, it stands for the e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury outbreak. And I'm sure this audience is familiar uh, with what happened in the fall of 2019, wherein uh, the use of uh, uh, cannabis containing vaping products uh, uh, that had vitamin E acetate in them uh, was responsible for causing a large amount of emergent care visits uh, and hospitalizations uh, stemming from the use of these products adulterated with an additive that caused severe pneumonia-like injuries to lungs. Uh, in the end, 2,800 people were hospitalized, 68 people were died in uh, almost entirely in the United States, a few were in Canada uh, by February 2020. Uh, and the Bali outbreak marked the largest amount of media attention that was ever foisted on the e-cigarette market. It also coincided with a huge spike um, in e-cigarette use in young people, uh, but had nothing quite to do with nicotine-containing e-cigarettes uh, that was driving prevalence. Uh, that was not what was sending people to the hospital. But nonetheless, uh, the um, Evali outbreak created a, what you call a, a problem definition, and that e-cigarette use became a problem, and government officials uh, especially in the United States, sort of were faced with the task of doing something. And so, uh, well, what happened to sales in this? And this is, of course, a, a, a presentation about sales. Well, before the Bali outbreak, before the it happened in the summer of 2019, so July of 2019, uh, uh, e-cigarette sales in the United States had grown almost unabatedly uh, for the past uh, uh, three years. Uh, and then uh, this was mostly driven by the rise of Juul and then uh, sales suddenly tumbled. Well, uh, we needed to figure out uh, what caused this. And there are two potential things. There's either the direct effects of the Bali outbreak and perhaps increasing harm perceptions around it as well as negative media attention. Uh, but there were also some policy responses that as we've said, so a problem was created uh, and uh, governors in particular in several US states exercised public health powers uh, to do something about it. And so, uh, what the most common response was, uh, was to propose a temporary ban on the sale of non-tobacco flavored e-cigarettes. This was proposed uh, in, in seven U.S. states. Five of them were able to implement it for even a few days. Uh, highlighted here, three of them will end up being in our data set, Michigan, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, one state uh, totally banned the sale of e-cigarettes for 90 days, and that was Massachusetts, uh, also in our data set and will be very, very important. Uh, and uh, they, after 90 days, reverted to a non-tobacco ban. 
the FDA sort of toyed with banning uh, the sale of flavored e-cigarettes during the same time, but this was later scaled back uh, to sort of a policy that took place after our uh, uh, after our investigative period. Um, so we're going to ignore it for the time being uh, because it's out of scope of it and it starts to uh, interact with the effects of uh, the pandemic uh, after February 2020. So we have three basic research questions in this paper, which was how did the Ivali outbreak directly affect sales of e-cigarettes, so not through any kind of policy intervention? How did the policy changes passed in the wake of Ivali affect e-cigarette sales? Uh, and so both of those kinds of policies that we were talking about, uh, I'll show you what they mean in regulatory stances parlance in just a second. But then even more important, I think, how do they affect cigarette sales? Uh, being that uh, cigarette sales are the, the marker of what does the real harm in uh, uh, the tobacco control world. Uh, how did that affect that outcome? So uh, in regulatory stances parlance, uh, if we say ban the sale of e-cigarettes that don't taste like tobacco or not flavored like tobacco, then we would expect that say uh, for menthol flavored e-cigarettes that should represent a prohibitionist stance so that they're just not allowed to be sold. The, right, the goal is to send that market to zero. Uh, tobacco flavored sales would then in the interim grow. The full e-cigarette market would then probably contract if, uh, if you're not allowed to sell uh, a bunch of different kinds of e-cigarettes. We just expect that to be a headwind, a competitive disadvantage for the market as a whole. We would also probably guess that uh, this would grow the cigarette market if, say, menthol cigarettes were allowed to be sold in cigarettes, uh, menthol was allowed to be in cigarettes and not in e-cigarettes. We might expect that. Uh, in reaction to a total e-cigarette ban, like what was done in Massachusetts, we might expect that to just be a prohibitionist policy across the board for e-cigarettes because literally nothing else was allowed to be sold and the goal is zero and that that would just represent an increase in sales of cigarettes. So that's the hypothesis that we should get and that's what regulatory stances theoretically should quickly structure for us. So what kind of data do we use? Well, it's my very favorite uh, sales data. So this is uh, Nielsen ScanTrack data. It's collected from universal product codes uh, that are on every package. Uh, it's a little 10 digit number. I'll show you what they look like on the next page. Um, but uh, we focus on sales of uh, cigarettes and e-cigarettes. We divide uh, the data for e-cigarettes into tobacco flavored refills, menthol flavored refills, other non-tobacco, non-menthol flavored refills and hardware as well as total sales. Uh, hard, uh, I think uh, at this point, disposables get to be credited as hardware. Uh, in this particular uh, version, this was um, in a period that was before the explosion in disposables because this happened that that happened after February 2020. Um, and cigarettes, I will explain. We divide them into three brand groups, and I'll explain what that means. But Nielsen Gate data comes from convenience food and drug stores. It excludes online and vape shop sales. We think it it, it represents around 70% of e-cigarette dollar sales by the uh, end of our survey. Um, less than that at the beginning. Cigarette sales, however, we think it covers well in excess of 90% of sales comparing unit volumes of the Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau uh, to Nielsen sort of verifies this. Um, universal product codes, again, are these barcodes that are, end up on the back of all sorts of products. Nielsen passively collects all this data and it is the underlying source of all of this analysis. Um, so for our data uh, analysis, we look at uh, difference per index per capita unit volumes uh, for e-cigarette sales by different categories and then cigarette sales by different brand groups. Uh, we look at uh, the portion of different four week periods that are covered uh, by either a total ban on e-cigarettes or a partial ban on e-cigarettes. Uh, and we look at different measures of the volley outbreak, uh, hospitalizations, media coverage, uh, collected through MIT Media Cloud, a volley cases and a volley deaths. Okay, this is a, a little thing that we did uh, to look at the impact of uh, cigarette sales. And so there are certain kinds of cigarettes that are smoked by young people, and there are certain kinds of cigarettes that are smoked not by not smoked by young people. And these are different brands. And so overall, say uh, in the NISDA data, we, we, we have found that about 1.8% of cigarettes are smoked by claimed to be smoked by people under 21. There are certain brands that are disproportionately used by young people up to 4% with mineral menthol. Uh, that are uh, smoked by young people. And we think that this is a decent marker. We have found it in previous work that say when Tobacco 21 passes, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, sales of young, what we call young brands decline, while sales of uh, brands that young people do not use, which we call disproportionately old brands, uh, they are not affected at all. We use the same uh, brand division here because uh, again, e-cigarette use is skews really young. And so we're just gonna use the same brands here as our young brands uh, to see whether or not a, uh, a ban on the sale of e-cigarettes uh, in any form affects sales of cigarettes. And so we expect the signal to be highest for disproportionately young brands. Um, these are the additional uh, uh, input variables that we use. We difference everything uh, in order to keep uh, 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 the uh, analysis uh, unskewed. We have problems with the unit root tests uh, if you don't difference things. So we look at time, price, Tobacco 21 coverage, the weather turns out to be very important with very cyclical cigarette sales. Uh, we look at unseasonably cold weather as well, and uh, availability and distribution of different products. So uh, with e-cigarette sales, uh, we essentially did some work to figure out what fits our model best. Uh, so we look here at total cigarette sales. Uh, and it turns out uh, using a full model uh, that uh, deaths uh, from a volley turned out to be the best fitting uh, measure of the of the valley outbreak, so we use it for everything else. So, um, notably, this is per capita uh, four week sales of e-cigarettes in dollars um, it divided up by uh, the type of state that was uh, uh, policies. So we have here in the dashed line Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts had very normal uh, e-cigarette sales levels prior to the valley outbreak and prior to its total ban on e-cigarettes. Uh, and those totally collapsed 98% uh, once a total ban went into effect. Uh, Oregon, Michigan, and Washington had different lengths of uh, implementation for their partial ban on e-cigarettes. Um, and uh, what you can see is that their sales also were very similar to other uh, uh, states before uh, Evali, and uh, they fell more than other states after Evali, at least in average terms. Uh, and then other states also fell off. Uh, there are 20 other states here uh, after that it fell off during a volley, and that's where we sort of ended up. Um, so uh, if we look at um, hardware or category level sales, we can see that where no state policy existed, uh, menthol flavor took off at, at, during the volley period, whereas in states where say menthol menthol sales were banned, it sort of fell uh, off during the volley period. Uh, as, along with uh, sales of non-tobacco flavors, those all fell off during the Evali period, uh, had to do with uh, changing federal policy that started to come into effect uh, right before then. And in Massachusetts, sales of everything fell all the way off. Importantly, tobacco flavored sales uh, rose in states with a partial ban uh, uh, during the, the period where tobacco was the only legal flavor of e-cigarettes. So again, this is looking at cigarette sales, and I think it's probably the more important question, but mostly what happened here is that sales of uh, cigarettes, uh, young brands and old brands, fell consistently throughout uh, 2019, uh, even during the Avali outbreak, uh, they, they, they fell quite a bit, but there's one exception to that, and that's in Massachusetts where we see uh, a spike in sales of young brands uh, that uh, we wanted to investigate further because it starts to look like uh, during that period, there were, it was a potential substitution towards cigarettes. Uh, so when we do our first difference results, uh, I'm only showing very simple tables and none of the covariates here just to make clear what we found. Uh, but uh, at the top level, Ovali seems to have decreased uh, sales of e-cigarettes. So these are e-cigarette sales here, uh, total sales, hardware, and other flavors um, uh, directly. Uh, state total ban days seems to have decimated uh, e-cigarette sales. Uh, so this is a, a log difference thing. So these are percentage changes, and it, it, it's a it's a number that's not my favorite to try to communicate, but it, it, it seems to be what, what worked and produced the, the least messy findings. Um, but uh, when we look at state partial ban days, it doesn't immediately jump out that uh, this affected the e-cigarette market, but we found out that this was because Massachusetts was included uh, in these analyses. And uh, in Massachusetts, a partial ban represented moving from 
uh, prohibitionist policy to a, a contractionist policy, whereas in Michigan, Oregon, and Washington, it represented moving from uh, a permissive policy to a contractionist policy. And so it was fundamentally different, uh, fundamentally different situation in Massachusetts uh, when they uh, uh, did a partial ban. And what we found there is that there was uh, indeed a significant negative effect on every part of the e-cigarette market from a partial ban, uh, except for tobacco flavors, which rose uh, in, in reaction to a uh, e-cigarette uh, partial ban. And then finally, uh, first uh, for the cigarette market, what we found was that uh, Evoli deaths were for some reason associated with lower cigarette sales. We couldn't get this to go away. It doesn't make a ton of sense. It could be seasonal, uh, being that just Evoli happened in the latter part of the year and that time trends might have been picking this up a little bit. We don't know. Um, but I don't think it's as important as uh, the state total ban days uh, uh, here. What we see is that uh, total cigarette sales seems to have risen during the uh, 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 total ban in Massachusetts, because remember, this, Massachusetts is the only one with a total ban, um, and that this effect is twice as strong as the total in young brands, and uh, it, it exists, again, in the age proportionate brands. It's also positive, uh, but it doesn't exist in the old brands. So it has that age gradient that makes us believe that this might be real, uh, that, that uh, for this particular kind of brand and for that particular intervention, it did uh, rise. And so for state partial ban days, uh, we uh, find no positive uh, impact on, on cigarette sales. So it's almost all, uh, uh, it's not significant or negative. Um, so the conclusions here are that e-cigarette sales declined in response to the Valley outbreak and in response to the e-cigarette, uh, uh, sorry, and response to the policy measures limiting the sale of e-cigarettes. But cigarette uh, sales, rose during Massachusetts' total ban on e-cigarette sales, but no rise in cigarette sales could be observed in reaction to the Abali outbreak or partial cigarette sales bans, which was sort of a big fear in this area, uh, that policies restricting e-cigarette sales or increasing negative harm possessions, uh, or perceptions may not, uh, may not have generated the worst possible outcome of substitution towards cigarettes in this particular kind of measure. This doesn't mean that uh, long-term uh, substitution patterns or initiation or cessation patterns couldn't be affected too. But using sales data, which is a really nice, passively collected, quick turnaround kind of data source, it wasn't. So uh, with that, I think it's time to pause for questions after a half an hour of me going very quickly. <laughs> so, Thanks, Alex. Um, I think first we will turn to our discussant, Catherine McLean, to see if she has any uh, questions or comments at this stage. Great, uh, thanks so much for this really interesting talk, Alex. Um, I just have a couple of questions. I'm gonna re refer back to your theoretical framework and I will attest, I, I am certainly not a political scientist, so I perhaps just am not familiar with this. Um, but I was really interested in your delineation across the range of regulatory stances, prohibitionists, so on and so forth. Um, should I be thinking, uh, first a clarifying question, should I be thinking about those as sort of like shares of the US population that will hold these views? Is that how I should think about them? No, um, it, it should be uh, a way to think of it as, as a goal. So when I say a share of the economy, I mean in terms of dollars of a share of economy of an economy. So that if we wanted to say uh, uh, put in a prohibitionist policy against uh, uh, cocaine, that would mean that the government has a goal of having cocaine play no role in the economy, having zero. And if we want to say uh, have an expansionist policy towards uh, electric vehicles, that means we want a larger share of the economy to be made up of the work uh, selling and buying electric vehicles. Okay, so this is uh, this is something that the government has as an objective. So we don't we shouldn't be thinking about people having these views because I guess what I was thinking is um, perhaps I just missed this, but could the market also be shifting the stances? I guess what I'm thinking is could these potentially be endogenous to the whole to the system? And if so, is that something we should also be thinking about? Because when I was hearing this, it seemed to me that perhaps this was, uh, we, the theory was presenting this as a fixed attribute of the economy or, or the population. Um, but so, is, could it potentially be endogenous? Yeah, it could be endogenous. It, and, and so it, it's, it's the preference that people may hold. So that your preference may be to move towards one. Uh, so say you supported a policy that changed the regulations in one way or the other. I think this is a good way to shorthand what's the effect of that particular policy and that your preferences around it to say 
expand, contract, uh, or do something else. Um, so it is uh, a way to uh, explain what preferences people hold in terms of kind of policies, what the effect of a policy is, and then say what the total in intended effect of policy is. It's, it's meant to cover a lot of these different situations in which we should be comparing and defining what a regulatory policy is. So it's meant to be very flexible and to be able to apply to a lot of these things. And it is changing uh, based on your perspective at any particular time. So just because uh, a policy can uh, say expands a market in the short run, it doesn't mean it will forever expand it and, and, and so on. So it could revert. Catherine, do you mind if I interject a question? Uh, there were a couple of questions sure. just on this point and then I'll turn back to you. So um, Alex, there were a couple of questions around sort of how we think about regulatory stances in the chat and the Q and A. So one was, how do we think about it when these regulations are actually shifting the, say, the, um, the, the mix of sales instead of sort of trying to shrink or grow them, for example, favoring um, big tobacco companies versus smaller or medium-sized businesses. And the other one is thinking about how do we think about it when different levels of government might have um, different uh, stances um, being more or less permissive. Yeah. So. Uh... The, the way to do it is to basically cut the market finer if you want to basically say that there is that uh, uh, a tobacco company is going to produce one type of product. And so basically that you can cut the regulatory stance, say, towards market like products that have received a modified risk uh, assessment from the FDA. Uh, those will be granted marketing advantages that will then grow their policy. Yes, that is a thing that is going to be, say, more accessible to a large company than a small company, uh, but it is a share of the market. It's definable in some way. And uh, the way then is to say that the regulatory stance uh, that they've received is probably more expansionist uh, than, say, uh, somebody who can't receive that particular designation. Uh, I like to think of, like, that's the difference with uh, pharmaceuticals that get FDA approval, that they get certain privileges uh, in return for going through that process to market, to uh, have insurance companies buy their products that say uh, the distributor of uh, an herbal supplement doesn't have, uh, they can make claims. Uh, and yes, different government levels of government can have different stances too. Uh, and so if one, if one municipality wants to have pot shops in every corner and another one doesn't want to have any uh, in, the, in, their, in their town, then you'd say one wants to contract and one wants to expand. Catherine, did, uh, did you have other thoughts uh, at this point? Just a, a qu another question. Um, I guess I really like this idea of, I think, of developing uniform language, and which I think is perhaps what you're getting at to some extent. Um, one question I have is, uh, this is perhaps more of a feasibility issue. I just, when I think about the discourse around some of these discussions, um, I'm wondering how do we how do we encourage the use of this language? I really liked how you said this could be something that we can say without causing hurt or pain, which I thought was very nice. But how, with the reality that we face in this in this space, how do you suggest infusing this uh, this into the vernacular? So the way that I, it, it, I am going to try to put it into my writing is to basically say that I will describe my own preference is to say, uh, I've been very open with this, I'd like to, to contract the cigarette market as aggressively as possible, as quickly as possible, uh, and do that through regulation. I have found that like when writing about e-cigarette regulation, the big uh, gap is between people who want to expand the e-cigarette market in order to displace the cigarette market and those who just want to contract both markets. Uh, and I, I think that is a, a, a good way to say it. I, I think being very honest and straightforward about that is, is useful. Uh, and that way we don't have to go to labels of precautionary and harm reduction, and uh, which, which don't have the same meaning and people get angry with each other saying, you're not truly precautionary, you're not truly harm reduction-y. And I, I, I think then basically putting this on a metric of what your goal is relative to market size is a pretty neutral thing. And uh, I put labels on them. Yes, prohibitionist carries a little bit of a, a, of a label. I've, I've heard eliminationist is potentially an alternative term for it, but 
my, my goal is to practice saying like, this is the effect that I think it's intended to have. Uh, and as you saw in the Avali example, uh, even though I expected the e-cigarette market, uh, the partial flavor ban to grow the cigarette market, it didn't, at least in this particular application. And so uh, it was even in a, in a place where perhaps intent or uh, uh, expected effect didn't meet reality. And I think it also provides uh, a testable hypothesis pretty, in a pretty straightforward way that is useful. Thank you. Just one quick question on your Avali study. I think this is more of a clarification question. Um, I, th I think I believe I saw on your slides there was difference from the maxima. Um, I hadn't. What could you speak to that? What differencing you were doing? Sorry. So uh, it was it was sort of a, di a difference from it, so it's sort of an index difference. So it's a percentage change from its maximum. So when the most uh, deaths were going on, uh, th that was sort of used as uh, uh, what we were measuring. So what was the Avali, how was the Avali outbreak being operationalized in terms of people being sick, uh, people being hospitalized, people uh, or the media talking about it, uh, and then uh, uh, people dying. So uh, it, was, it was sort of a uh, change from the maximum exposure. Is there a reason why not something perhaps more like the mean? I guess I'm just a little, uh, a little bit concerned that perhaps you know, if there's 68 deaths, I believe, from the valley, sort of different things mm -hmm. in the maximum, like, should we, should we be concerned about that at all? We could, we get very similar results through all of these, except for, um, I, I think it's, I think uh, hospitalizations produces a, a, a weirder shape, but all the, all the others, for some reason, produ and produced a pretty similar finding of, of the general thing. Um, so, yeah, it's possible to to think that it's a weird uh, it, it, to be concerned about that, uh, but we, we can look at the uh, supplement of the paper and we found very similar outcomes for the basic findings. Thank you very much. Um, so very quickly, and then we can uh, continue with the, the talk. There are a few clarifying questions about the Nielsen data. One is, um, are manufacturers able to manipulate the UPC codes that um, are in the data set? So, um, you know, alter the, the sales data in any way. Um, another, I'm just gonna ask these and you, you can take these all, all at once. Um, and, and another one is, is there a bias in the fact that um, it's mainly uh, big tobacco companies that tend to be disproportionately sold within the stores that are in your data set as opposed to the smaller vape shops, shops and how that might affect the generalizability. And then finally, um, what about the uh, vape shops relative to gas and convenience stores um, as a percent of the total e-cigarette market and how that affects your generalizability? Yeah, so the manipulation thing, I don't know how they would manipulate it. Uh, th this is passively collected data that's, that's used to look at sales of bread and uh, 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 Nerf guns too. Uh, so I, I don't know how anyone would manipulate it. Uh, Nielsen collects all this data, uh, and, and I, I don't know what they would do um, to manipulate it. As uh, um, I, I mentioned before, we think based on what uh, e-cigarette intelligence and Euromonitor estimate the size of the total use U.S. market for e-cigarettes as, um, we think that it now represents about 70% of sales. We're well certain that we're in excess of 90% of cigarette sales. So even if we do have these issues with, say, not capturing all of the small e-cigarette companies, we're really sure we're capturing the huge bulk of effect on cigarette sales. So when we're talking about changes in e-cigarette policy affecting cigarette sales, we're really going to catch uh, uh, with a really sensitive measure what's happening to cigarette sales. Um, so yeah, there are biases in terms of who is included in this data set, but I don't know of another set that allows me to say, understand what, what kind of, uh, uh, what share of sales and vape shops in Michigan in October, 2019 were menthol flavored. That, that data, I, I would love to know where it is. And if anyone's on this call who does know, I would love to be able to look at that because that would, that is missing part of this picture. And Nielsen captures this other picture, but it doesn't, it, it, it I don't know a way to look at the other one yet in a good longitudinal data set. Okay, great. Well, why don't you uh, continue with your talk and uh, we'll take more questions at the end. All right. So uh, 
next we come to the Polish menthol cigarette ban. So uh, in May 2020, when lots of other things were happening with COVID, uh, menthol cigarette sales uh, ended across the European Union. Prior analyses of menthol cigarette bans uh, have come from areas with men where menthol cigarette spheres uh, were, were small or where there was legal access to menthol cigarette sales in close proximity. So like San Francisco had legal access to menthol cigarettes in San Jose and Canada only had menthol cigarette sales shares under 5%. Uh, by for comparison, uh, in the United States, 35 to 40% of menthol of, sale, of cigarette sales now are menthol cigarettes. Uh, so it's hard to sort of say what kind of dose of treatment we're seeing in these particular countries are perhaps uh, analogical to the entire United States. Um, and so if say sales were banned in the United States, there would be a really hard way to say supply menthol cigarettes in a legal way to meet 40 or 35% of the total market. So uh, we're going to Poland for to look at this. Now, I consider a menthol cigarette ban to be a prohibitionist policy on menthol cigarettes. Uh, it will be a slightly expansionist policy on standard unflavored cigarettes. Uh, but on total cigarette sales, we expect this to be a contractionist policy. So why did we look at Poland? Well, Poland had much higher menthol cigarette sales share uh, before their menthol cigarette ban than any other country who has ever attempted a menthol cigarette ban. It was around 28%. So not quite as high as the US, but pretty close. Uh, and so uh, what we decided to do was use a bite style difference in differences regression analysis to measure whether or not cigarette sales declined uh, after the menthol ban. So we used Nielsen uh, sales data for May 2018 to April 2021 and had to control for a lot of changes around COVID. Uh, and so we use a, uh, an aggressive regression that exploits a difference in exposure to uh, menthol cigarettes at the regional level, uh, which was the share of menthol cigarettes sold uh, before the ban to determine the effect of the treatment, the menthol cigarette sales ban on sales. So uh, we look at uh, sales in eight regions of Poland, uh, sort of divided up on this map. Uh, we have seven regions shown here, plus the city of Warsaw, which is excised uh, from the central region. Uh, these sales are uh, monthly and split out by flavor. So we look at standard and menthol for both cigarettes and separately uh, roll your own tobacco. Uh, we did a, a GLM regression analysis with maximum uh, least squares or maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, this is the model uh, for those who want to see it. We use clustered standard errors at the regional level of regional fixed effects uh, to try to control for unobserved variables we were not able to catch over time. Uh, we generally control for menthol share, the presence of the menthol ban, the weather, whether or not a uh, state bordered uh, uh, a European Union country and whether that border was open uh, at, in a particular month, COVID part uh, affected this. Uh, Non-European Union border status, uh, we used uh, Apple walking data uh, during the pandemic to measure how much people were walking once uh, lockdowns uh, had happened, uh, as well as the employment rate and price. Um, so I'm going to show a couple of descriptive statistics, which are uh, menthol cigarette sales uh, were uh, quickly replaced by standard cigarette sales after the ban. You can see the red line, which represents menthol sales, sort of plummets to zero. Uh, menthol uh, or standard sales go up to meet the gray line up there, which is total sales. So that just sort of represents that transition. Uh, the black line, which is roll your own sales, to just continue growing after the ban. There's no particular huge spike. Um, we might have expected that roll your own sales could have grown because they are easier to impart a menthol ban by simply including a very legal uh, mentholated filter, uh, which was not affected by the policy. So the question was, was this menthol to standard replacement enough to stop any loss in total cigarette sales? Uh, so we looked at prices here and uh, across these different regions, we saw that after the menthol cigarette ban, total prices declined. Uh, not only for uh, 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 all cigarettes, but for uh, unflavored cigarettes as well, which now made up the vast majority of remaining cigarette sales. Uh, menthol prices uh, initially increased as their uh, scarcity uh, sort of led to problems of supply and demand and prices having to rise to match that. Uh, and so uh, yeah, prices dropped across all legal categories. Uh, so 
because of the difference in differences uh, analysis design, we had to perform an event study. And so uh, initially we would have expected uh, the sales to change here to uh, be around zero uh, for all prior periods to treatment. Uh, it wasn't quite met. Uh, and so it doesn't cleanly pass a wall test, but it does hover around zero for a cigarette sales event study. So this is looking at cigarette, uh, uh, cigarette sticks per capita per month. Um, and we can see at the point where the menthol ban comes into effect in May 2020, sales drop off, uh, but then they quickly recover and are hover around zero for the remainder of our analytical period. And that would be right after prices fell. Uh, for roll your own cigarettes, we uh, again, this doesn't for some reason pass a wall test, uh, but it does hover around zero. Uh, and then it does initially decline right after uh, the, the, the menthol ban, but it also doesn't, it overlaps zero almost the entire time. Uh, so we don't really see much of an effect size. Uh, looking at the fully adjusted regression results, uh, I'm gonna just draw you all to the bottom of the chart. We, we basically see uh, effects for weather. So cold weather sells fewer cigarettes, uh, open U borders sell more cigarettes, Polish uh, cigarettes are cheaper than their uh, neighbors in, in Germany who typically come over and buy, legally buy Polish cigarettes. Closing the border in Poland uh, caused uh, cigarette sales to increase to uh, when it was closed to non-EU borders, uh, to Ukraine uh, in particular, uh, because these were sources of illicit cigarettes. And that does seem to be that uh, something that uh, sort of resolved itself in a good way during the pandemic in that illicit sales dropped. Uh, walking more sells more cigarettes. Uh, and uh, higher employment rates sold more cigarettes. But looking at the menthol ban and the average treatment share, uh, we see that uh, we, on average, there was a decline of 2.15 cigarettes per month uh, for cigarettes. Uh, this, this was a, a p-value of about 0.2 though. Uh, it represents about a two, 3% decline in sales, uh, but not a significant one. And when you throw price into the regression, it goes even further in, to be further insignificant. Um, and there's no significant changes in roll your own sales either. Uh, this is in total cigarette sales. Uh, so just to make that clear. The way that this looks uh, when you split it out by pre-ban menthol share uh, is even a little more depressing. Uh, but we do here find that in Warsaw, the uh, uh, region of the country that is the wealthiest and that had the most menthol cigarette sales. So this is about 38% of menthol cigarette sales. Uh, they were the only region to find a significant decline uh, in share. Uh, in, sale, in total sales of cigarettes. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not the most ex uh, uh, encouraging finding uh, because the EU menthol ban does not seem to have significantly decreased total cigarette sales in Poland. Uh, yeah, more regions with more menthol share at baseline saw larger declines post ban and some of those were, were significant, but it was only significant for the highest region. Uh, and I think this has to do partially with cigarette prices falling after the ban. So uh, that potentially could have um, staunched any decline in, in demand. Um, and then these border effects are also interesting, but more to the poles who uh, have to deal with these cross-border problems. Um, another thing that we have to worry about is that uh, there was a lot of open evasion of the menthol cigarette ban in Poland. Tobacco companies reformulated and renew released new tobacco products and flavoring products to evade the menthol ban. Uh, so some of them created uh, little cigars uh, that were flavored, uh, as happened here in the United States when clove cigarettes became clove cigars in 2010. Uh, but more worrying was the invention of these flavoring cards down at the bottom. Rizla flavor infusion cards are little uh, about 15 cent cards you can buy. You open them, put them in your cigarette pack, and an hour later, they uh, your, your regular cigarettes taste like menthol. Whether these products are causing uh, the menthol cigarette ban to fall short of expectations needs to be evaluated. I need to buy more Nielsen data, unfortunately, to figure that out, to try to track uh, sales of uh, the UPC here on Rizla's flavor infusion cards. Uh, and that leaves me with some lessons that we could explore, but we also have 10 minutes left. So maybe I'm gonna just cut it short here and pivot to questions if that'd be all right. Um, sure, well, why, why don't you spend oh, two yeah. minutes Alex then just, just summarizing right. um, and, and then oh. we'll pivot to questions. All right, so I guess I wanna pitch here, sales data is enormously useful, passively collected and enables comparative policy evaluation in really neat ways. Uh, if you can creatively split and analyze this data, you can tell deeper stories about it than we're typically used to. And I'm, I'm rather proud of the 
uh, splitting, say, of cigarette brands into different uh, uh, demographics. Uh, and I, I think this needs to be done more often, uh, looking at socioeconomic status, racial divisions, uh, and, and other things to get a better, more granular look at how markets are changing. Um, I think this analysis need to be done more time in, in a really timely fashion. So this is the first public presentation of sales data evaluating a huge public policy change that happened a year and a half ago. And that is a, a little bit maddening that this isn't more uh, systematically available and ready to do uh, for such big policy changes. Um, it, it's a, it's a long-term problem to fix, uh, but these data are really expensive, especially outside the United States. And I'd love to put heads together on figuring out a systematic solution to this. Uh, regulatory policy in itself, uh, I have to just sort of pitch the idea that checking for unintended consequences of policy change is essential. And sales data is a nice way to start doing that, at least on a short-term basis. Uh, I think we can uh, do these sort of analyses and improve implementation gaps uh, faster uh, and, 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 and meet the, the expectations of policy by doing really rapid response evaluation of policy. Um, I think we need to extend the evaluations of the flavor bans that I saw here to permanent sales bans uh, that are in place in New York, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. Uh, and really, we should also keep an eye on examining tensions between short and long run outcomes. Uh, so I identify short run outcomes here, uh, but understanding the relationship, say, between a loss in cigarette sales or a growth in cigarette uh, in e cigarette sales and initiation rates and cessation rates uh, is essential to understanding long run policy outcomes. So uh, those are my basic lessons. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I think I'll first turn it over to Catherine to see if she has any questions. Uh, just a, a couple of quick questions. Alex, I really enjoyed this talk. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the things that you just touched on, I thought was to me, I mean, all of this was a very interesting and important, but I really like that work you've done with NISDA, where you've looked at the brands, I think, and then kind of mapped that to your sales data. I think that's very innovative and rich and can allow for a lot of questions that we might not otherwise be able to answer with the sales. So that's really fantastic. Uh, one thing I'm wondering is, uh, do we think, like, how, how far can we go with NISDA in that direction? That is, I think NISDA is about, what, 70,000 observations a year. How finally do you think we can cut this down um, to look at these different shares by the demographics? Like, you've looked at youth here, but you also spoke about some important demographics by like, socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity. Um, how far can we go? I would stick to cigarettes the first. Uh, the, the, the number of observations are uh, adequate enough to do that. Um, I wouldn't split it too finely uh, because uh, there is some instability. And say I've, done, I've, I've repeated this work in cigars and it's sort of maddeningly unstable compared to the cigarette stuff. I get sort of contrasting answers between survey um, uh, surveys that uh, on this information. The cigarette stuff has been much more durable in the sense that I can look at NISDA, I can look at PATH, and the same brands that are young in uh, NISDA are young in PATH, and there is not a lot of uh, conflict between them over the over time too. So I think as long as uh, the the graph demographic you're looking at is producing a stable answer about which ones are, are uh, young or old or, or, or which ones are disproportionately used by different groups over time, I think that provides uh, a, a reasonable limit to when you should do these splits. Yeah. I guess and that can be potentially a bit concerning when we're thinking about a market that's changing quickly like like e-cigarettes or when we're thinking about the delay that NISDA has um, in terms of being released. Um, I guess yes. speaking to that, um, I know that this is probably like a big picture question too, but I guess I'm, is there any way we can, the price of data, that's something that's above my pay grade, but it does seem that it's shockingly slow to get data available. When I, when I talk to um, purveyors of claims, insurance claims data, they seem to be a bit faster. Do you have any thoughts on that? Have you had discussions to know, is there anything we can do or is this just something we'll keep repeat saying we'd like data faster so we can study qu questions in a more timely manner? Or do you see, something on the horizon that might be optimistic for the researcher? Uh, I mean, the University of Chicago's like Kilt Center, uh, the fact that they warehouse all the Nielsen data on a uh, slow rolling basis 
Um, he also has this habit, weirdly, of destroying data after five years because it's apparently not useful to look back further than that. Using something like that model uh, that pools resources to purchase data in a faster way and make it available in a more systematic way uh, is probably the thing to do, but it requires getting the right um, uh, assurances uh, and funding to do it. Um, and so what I, I would suggest is figuring out a way to repeat their model internationally or uh, uh, faster. Uh, so I, I haven't been in those the, that kind of negotiating to set up that kind of contract, but Nielsen charges really high prices and I, I had to negotiate quite a bit to purchase my Polish data with the budget that I had. Uh, so um, just from personal experience, it's really hard to go and ask a question, raise the money and get the funds uh, in any kind of timely manner. So we'll, we'll just keep fighting the good fight, trying to get data faster. But anyway, thank you so much. This was a really fascinating talk. Uh, very much enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. And so I think we might continue a couple minutes past the hour, just so uh, the audience is aware. But there's a couple other questions I'll, I'll throw out there. So um, there's a couple asking about um, patterns of, of use by demographic subgroups. So here in the US, of course, it's uh, have we waited towards African American uh, smokers? And so in Poland, is uh, do you know if there's differences by uh, by men, women, rural, urban, and especially uh, somebody I was asking about by uh, by age group, um, young versus old, and uh, following up whether this looking at sales data in aggregate, whether this is masking subgroup differences um, that might have existed? Yeah. Uh, so the the typical smoker of a cigarette that's mentholated in Poland is more likely to be female young, urban, and high socioeconomic status uh, than the, the other kinds of smokers, uh, than the smokers of non-menthol cigarettes. So it's a very different demographic uh, than a menthol smoker is in the United States, with probably the exception of the, the urban and, and the young part. Um, but uh, it, it, it can, without getting access to say brand level data, it, we might be masking some of these uh, demographic differences. However, I also don't know the brand level differences of who uses which brand in Poland. However, uh, that's not saying it's just something like the ITC data couldn't be used to suss that out uh, in Poland and perhaps do some future analysis that looks more like this American data uh, in, in places uh, abroad, given the right kind of data. Okay, um, so then the, the this will be then the last question. So. Uh, I'll combine two others that, that were sort of uh, questioning, I suppose, the, what you found in the, the menthol um, ban studies in Poland. So uh, what would the effect might have been had prices not dropped um, is one question. And another having to do with whether you would have anticipated um, any short sort of short term effect, uh, the idea that this might have been a longer term um, effect on, on youth uptake and that you might not expect to, to see this. What are your thoughts on those? Um, I, I think that based on the second question, I think that's something we can still hold out that will change in Poland. Uh, I, I, I think that it, my prima facie expectation was that there would be a short-term effect, that such a large disruption uh, to the market would have some sort of detectable significant average effect, um, being that uh, so much of the, the, everybody's favorite product went away. Uh, the fact that it was instantly replaced was a bit of a shock. Um, we would have, uh, I, I, I've seen expectations of the effects of a menthol ban in the United States representing something like a five to 7% decline uh, as estimated in like Wall Street reports and things like that. So I expected something more on that end than the 2% that I found uh, in Poland, even with a similarly large treatment. Um, the... Uh, I'm trying to find the other one that you're asking. Sorry. It was about prices. Uh, uh, had prices not dropped? So had prices not dropped, uh, we probably would have expected a bit larger of an effect. Um, and it could have maybe been in the 5% range if that had, if that had kept up. Uh, because what we saw was uh, on, on the event study, sorry, we, we, we saw prices fall, or, or sales fall almost 20 sticks per person per month. That's quite a lot in that initial part. We don't know if that would have necessarily uh, maintained that that, would, that represented something like uh, a 20% drop. Uh, but 
we don't, it, it also coincided with COVID lockdown and a lot of other stuff uh, that was going on in that time period. Um, but would it have stayed uh, down below zero? Possibly. Um, I, I think it's it's pretty reasonable to assume that it would have just simply based on people's budgets wouldn't have grown in reaction to it. Great. So well, I think we're out of time. So why don't I uh, turn it over to, to see to take us out. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, we are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 300 people for your participation. Have a top-notch weekend.